How to win to 10 meters. So this is going to be look at some different ways that we can get out of the blocks quick. And it's going to tie into a lot of foot stuff because really plantar flexion seems to be the key in how we can get there. But before we do that, I want to take a, a planned tangent uh, to deal with shoes. And shoes will tie into plantar flexion and how well our feet work and getting to 10 yards. But how important are the shoes that you train in? So this could be for your athletes or for you or anyone in your family. Um, some pretty interesting guys from Harvard wrote an exercise science review that, about what are the trade-offs with shoes choice? So that you get positive with some designs and you get negatives as well. And that's what they're looking at. So the first thing that they looked at was shoe mass first, the cost of locomotion. Uh, a leg, a leg swing costs 20% of your energy. Again, if you want to look at improving energy, you can do leg swings for time and for speed. Every increase of 100 grams costs 1% of energy. So again, now we're looking at uh, Lila exogen stuff. But increased sole can save energy if the sole material is identical throughout the bottom of the shoe, made of the same material and stiffness throughout all three points of measure, contact, mid stance, and toe off. I'm putting this in there not only because we're looking to see how much it costs to swing a leg and shoes actually help you conserve some of that energy, but how many pairs of shoes do you know that have air bottoms or they're made of different materials? Maybe nothing is there. Um, and that's a key thing that shoe companies do that to save money on material, but we pay for it because it's only doing us good is if the whole bottom is the same. No air pocket, no gel pocket, none of those things. Um, so an interesting point there. The effects of compressive stiffness on ground reaction impulse versus force rate. Um, so again, thick-soled shoes influence compressive stiffness, uh, but it changes how times things are timed out, especially if we have a really thick heel and we heel strike because of that heel. It actually doubles the amount of peak force when you hit if that heel hits first. So we question, do we really need that really thick heel? Because even though thicker shoes dampen the force and decreases elastic hysteresis, it can help prevent, event, prevent injury, but then the thicker sole becomes your Achilles and your plantar flexors and we train in those shoes a lot and do a lot in those shoes and then expect to run and get something out of our Achilles and plantar flexors when they haven't been working because of the shoe that we wear. And then we try to race and try to get something out of them. Uh, now we're looking at the height of the shoe. Again, I've already mentioned about the increased height can lead to an early heel strike, but it also puts our foot in a more plantar flexed position. And with that elevated heel, we don't really need to use our plantar flexion where the actual shoe becomes your plantar flexor. The peak torque output for your ankle is slightly above 90 degrees. And if this shoe raises above that, we never use, learn to use our plantar flexion strength when we sprint. Uh, and it also changes the moment arm of when we actually go into plantar flexion. Uh, the flaring on the side. Uh, the extra flaring on the side prevents pronation and eversion, but if we have solidified the foot, something else is going to have to move in or out uh, if the shoe is taking care of the foot, and that's when we get medial knee pain. So a lot of time, your athletes will complain of knee pain, and you look at their shoes, they probably have a wide flared shoe, and they don't have great running mechanics. So instead of being hurt, I would have them change their shoes out, uh, get something that has l a much smaller heel and a less wider heel. Um, it does, the thicker the bottom of the shoe, the less sensory perception you have. And the reason why that is of note is because when we train in those really thick shoes and then all of a sudden we put on our carbon fibers, this is when we get the injuries with the carbon fiber shoes that all the sprinters like to wear, or now distance runners too. Um, you can't jump back and forth without there being some intermediate situation and expect to get everything we can out of that shoe. 
So what am I recommending? Well, if you go to the websites, they call them lifestyle shoes, but really they were the shoes that people wore in the 60s and 70s and even early 80s before Nike took off uh, that had a shoe design that dealt with all these issues. And if you think about it, back in the day, you did not have a lot of injuries like we have today. Uh, yeah, I think we all know that. Us older guys know that, that there were not a lot of ACL injuries back in the day. It's only become as shoes have become more and more, as they would say, advanced, when really cheaper. Uh, sole bending stiffness for a force versus the velocity of plantar flexors. This has to do with your timing of your propulsion and your plantar flexion. Uh, and if we can get it right, you create a gear ratio. And the stiffer the, sue, the stiffer the sole, you actually can increase the gear ratio of your foot. So all the shoes that they sell today, you can twist them in the middle. Uh, we want something that's stiff so we can get more of a catapult effect out of our foot, a lever. Um, Again, they have their benefits. They're great for walking and slow running, but for training, they are not great. So if we think about that and we look at what actually happens with this plantar flexion, this is what actually happens, is you're going to see that the ball of the foot becomes what we are going to hinge over. And that's going to create the lift, and it's not a purely vertical lift. Ideally, we want it to move us horizontally. So if we're going to see a really good example of that, we're going to watch Usain Bolt here, who's going to come bouncing by here. And we can watch his heels come up off the ground. He hits. And watch his heel extend. You can see the plantar flexion already happening in his calf. And we get that pure bounce coming out. Here it is in a little slower motion, but you can see that, that heel lift. That's the plantar flexion that we're looking for. That's where his power is coming from. That's his spring. There it is in slow motion, up close. Once again, so you can see it really well. That's running plantar flexion. And he's accelerating right there. Roll right up over the toe. That's where his power comes from. He doesn't bend his legs very much. That's all coming from his ankles. So the arch support and your foot muscle strength and the locomotor, locomotor cost. Uh, arch support limits strain on plantar fascia and intrinsic muscles but leads to atrophy of those muscles. So if we are trying to give, put on a shoe that gives us arch support, we're actually creating plantar fasciitis and other problems down the road, especially if all of our intrinsic muscles stop working because of our shoe choice. So one way to get around this is when you are training, try to keep your toes up the best that you can. You'll see, especially today, kids that can't lift up their toes at all. How are we going to give them any kind of arch support to create that catapult if we can't keep put up our toes? And then the shoes that we're wearing discourage the ability to create the arch support in your foot. So here's an exercise. Uh, this person did not have very strong or a big fat pad on the bottom, but toes are up and we're just going to work on rolling over the top to create that hinge. Uh, and so the feet can, the arches can do their job of supporting that foot to create a structure that we can catapult off of. Uh, and we're going to see when we talk about starts that that ball of the toe becomes the hinge that we move over. So I don't know if this is a great exercise, a great way to train this is in the traditional old-fashioned calf raise machine because a lot of times when people push up, they push off the side of the foot. And if you watch where their shins go, their shins go to the outside. When if we look at really good sprinters, that's not what's happening at all. You know, I could say if maybe if you put all your weight on the ball of your big toe and you had some kind of forward movement instead of purely vertical movement, it might be a more appropriate exercise. So again, we're going to look at Bolt with his catapults. We can see the plantar flexion when he comes off the ground. Perfect world when he cycles that leg through. That's just a response. That leg cycling is a response to the tension that's on the floor that will help pull it through. 
I'm not saying that hip flexors don't do a lot to help that. They do, which is if you saw my previous presentation, you'll understand that. But that's what we're looking for. So how does this tie into starts? Well, depending on the research that you look at, plantar flexion is responsible for 50 to 90% of the power coming out of the blocks as far as six steps out. Uh, some of the papers show that the glutes are really just stabilizers in acceleration. Hamstring's gonna give you some power. That transfers to that foot into the ground. So, how do we win to 10 meters? It's really a question who generates the most power per kilogram, or another way of looking at it is who gets to four meters a second first. That's the major question. So this is a very good sprinter. You can see that in uh, 20 meters, they're almost hitting nine meters a second. I can't say who this is, but you can see that they are at three meters a second by the time they get block clearance, and then they are just over four meters a second by their second step. Sadly for this person, uh, they had, had an injury. Uh, they never really came back, and you can see the difference uh, in the impact that it has in overall speed and time. Uh, they just can't get out. Here is a person that's a great weight room person but it doesn't matter how much you squat if you can't hit that four meters a second or even three meters a second by that block clearance. So a lot of times that big squat doesn't really help much uh, when you're getting out of the blocks. And then you can see how they flatten out in their steps and they're not really accelerating anymore. Here's someone that's really good, uh, an all-state sprinter. Uh, three meters a second on that first step, huge push on that second step, and they're at almost five meters a second by that second step. Uh, this person was a 10-6 kid. And another elite sprinter. Uh, hitting the marks to hit the times that they need.